and welcome to Lake Kickers Live. It is Tuesday night, August 10th, the year of our Lord, 2021. You heard me right. It's Tuesday. Three a weeks is back. Our back. It's back. The season format is back. So we're here from now until we crown a national champion and probably a few weeks beyond that. Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday night, 8 Eastern, 7 Central. You, of course, also have two mailbags coming your way that are exclusive to the Late Kick podcast feed. We had one out just this morning in which we delved into very, very fascinating and very, very unique aspects of college football. So make sure you're subscribed there and subscribed on the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel. I'm not here to beg, though. I'm here to tell you we have a jam-packed show tonight, and we're going all over the country. We're going to hit a bunch of outposts in the SEC. Where are we going tonight, actually? So we're going to hit Tennessee, A&M, Bama, LSU, Georgia, but we're also going Florida State. We're going Ohio State. Uh, we'll hit some Michigan. We're going to talk a bunch of Pac-12. Did I say Florida State? Probably already once. Look, we've got a lot to discuss tonight. And then I'm doing the Inside Carolina podcast in about an hour. So that means it's an impossibility for us to go over an hour tonight, which means we got to pack it all in. We got to get to work. Also, do you hear the sound? It's very faint. It's just a but that is the sound of the Ramen Noodle Express. It's been MIA over the course of the summer because there's no games to bet on over the summer. But we are rapidly approaching the time, my friends, when it is time for you to pull that wallet out, maybe cobwebs and all, and it's time for us to get off that ramen noodle diet, and it's time for us to enter the real world. It's time for us to get in line with the rest of society, and to do that, we got to make some money. we got to bet some winners, and we're going to discuss some games of the year tonight, and I'm going to show you the Vegas number. Four out of the five games we'll talk about, at least, already has a line posted on it, Game of the Year stop. And then I'm going to show you what our internal model says about it. Now, those of you who have been around for a while, or at the very least were around last year, know to pay attention when the late kick uh, model starts speaking this time of year. And so we'll discuss that. And then I'm also going to give you our biggest questions in the Pac-12. So keep in mind, as is the case with the Ramen Noodle Express and many other things on this show, not everything that happens with the show is happening right here at this desk. A lot of things are happening during the week in the season when we're handing out bets and whatnot, when we're talking about betting, but also when we're talking about breaking news, when we're talking about all sorts of different things that happen across the landscape of this sport, Twitter and Instagram's where you want to be, at Late Kick Josh. And I've told you as we get closer to the season, there's going to be a lot on there that's not on the show. Some of you didn't believe me until you were following that Instagram channel yesterday, and then you checked out that story and saw some weird things, didn't you? Saw some things you'd never seen before. The rest of you will see in due time, but I would strongly encourage you, beat the rush. Follow me over there, at Late Kick Josh. Also, as we dive in tonight, I put out a call to action for a family in need in Oconee, Georgia, the other night. And as I expected, I got an email the next day from the family saying they got a huge surge in donations right after the show went off the air. They are still taking donations, and so that is our audience in action, which I refer to more as a community at this point, a really big one, than an audience, uh, because that's kind of what we try and do. Whenever we can help out one of our own, we do it. And so thank you so much. I knew you would come to the forefront very quickly with that. And so they wanted me to tell you thank you. I want to tell you thank you. Okay, let's dive into the show tonight. The first thing I want to do, as we do every leadoff to every August show, is we got to talk latest whispers and intel out of camps. We're going to go SEC. We're going to zoom it out nationally in that order. SEC camp intel. I want to start in Baton Rouge tonight. LSU's running backs have to be better. Now, if you're an LSU Tiger fan, you know that. If you are, let's say, a college football fan and you watched LSU last year, but it's been a year now. It's been several months, and so you don't really remember exactly the details of why they were so poor on the field. You just remember that they were poor last year. Well, it wasn't one glaring area. It was like five of them. But running back was one of them. And it feels like, even though they're listed as, I think both are sophomores, but even though they're not listed as seniors, it feels like John Emery has been around forever. It feels like Ty Davis Price. Those are names that have been around forever. And it feels like every week I'm sitting there and I'm I'm feeling like that's the week, or in the case of a whole season, this is the season that those guys are going to erupt. It's not for lack of ability, but for a number of contributing reasons. Hasn't happened yet over the course of a full season. Hasn't happened yet. Well, boy, does this need to be that season. Now, I felt this way before Miles Brennan went down, whether he was going to win that starting job at quarterback or not. But when he does go down, which he has now, It thins out that quarterback room again. What once looked to be a massive depth strength for them is now Max Johnson and a true freshman in Garrett Nussmeyer. 
it puts even more of a premium on them being able to run the ball. Now, that's always going to be key for LSU football, but you have a couple of added dynamics here that they have to have. These are not, these are not either ors. You know, these are not debatable. These are have-to-haves for LSU. The ability to control a game and then the ability to close a game. They couldn't do either one last year. They got to be able to do that. And to do that, I know right now, I think it's Davis Price who's injured, not long-term, it doesn't look like at least, but he's missed a couple of days of practice. But those guys have to be right, and they have to be right the whole season. Uh, because if you're not hearing those names early and often for LSU, you know, they don't feel internally that they're able to maximize their potential if those guys don't live up to the billing. And I would agree with that. At Alabama, I'm going to read you some names. I was just doing this. It was an exercise out in the newsroom with Director Colin a second ago. Colin works, well, obviously he works here, and he does all the late kicks, but he also does our signing day shows. Uh, Director Colin chops up some recruiting video every now and then, so he is fluent in recruiting, and he sees all the names come across his desk. So I said, hey, Colin, I'm going to bounce some names off of you. He said, all right, weirdo, go ahead. I said, uh, tell me what you think about this list. Will Anderson, Drew Sanders, Quindarius Robinson, Dallas Turner, Chris Allen, Chris Braswell, Keanu Coat, Christian Harris, Henry Toa Toa, Demoy Kennedy, Jalen Moody, and Shane Lee. And Colin asked me, wow, that's Alabama's defense, huh? No, that's Alabama's linebacker room, period. It's just the linebacker core. That's as insane a depth chart at any position group as you will ever see. You're talking about like Ohio State wide receiver. This is the defensive version of that. Alabama's linebacker room. I had someone text me the other day, and now I'm going to restate it because I saw we had a little glitch, and I'll probably want to use this as a soundbite. I had someone text me today, actually, and they said, Alabama's got guys running with the threes that I would feel totally confident building a linebacker room around if we were in another program. There are players like Dallas Turner, for example, was a five-star, according to the 24-7 Sports Composite, this last cycle. It depends on where you look, but you have him running three, you have him running four. I don't think he'll stay there. But when you look at the rotation there, you've got so many names. Virtually all these guys were four or five-star coming out of high school, and none of them were overrated, I can assure you. And we've had some weeding out at this position, and even now, that's what that unit looks like. So... I wanted to remind you just two years ago, was it two or three years ago, it was really multiple years, this was a glaring position of weakness for Alabama to show you how insane their recruiting is and it seems like how quickly they filled this hole. In reality, it feels like an eternity. If you were watching Shane Lee and Christian Harris, both as true freshmen, when they had to start, I think it was against Duke, I think it was at that game, against Duke in week one of the, I think it was the 2019 season, because they didn't have any, they had some transfers and then they had some injuries and all of a sudden you're starting two true freshmen. I think that was when Dylan Moses went down right before the season began and it terminally impacted Alabama's defense. You didn't know it at the time, but it terminally impacted their defense. You don't want to root for injury ever, but I'm telling you they can afford to incur quite a few right now and still have all American caliber linebacker play. This is the envy of the rest of the country, at least when it comes to linebacker depth. So um, there is nothing that you are not seeing there. Everything is as it appears on the surface. At Georgia, we got a little situation to talk about that has arisen since you and I last spoke. So we, we last talked to each other on Sunday, so it hasn't been that long ago. But we have an injury that's crept up at Georgia on the offensive line, and it's at center. So Warren Erickson was penciled in to be the starting center for Georgia. Now, he is a guy who got some action last year, but he wasn't a starter last year, so he is stepping into the shoes of a departing starter. And now he's out with, I think, a hand injury, and it'll be multiple weeks, and the, the smart money is on him missing the Clemson game at this point. Well, this is not ideal, but it's really not ideal when you consider what this potentially does to Kirby Smart's team and already a matchup disadvantage that they were going to have. Now, full disclosure, if you look at this Clemson-Georgia game, Neither staff feels great about their offensive line versus the opposition's defensive line. It is a matchup edge both ways. Georgia and Clemson have two of the best defensive lines in the country. So this was already going to be a situation. Clemson's going to deal with this too. Injury or not, Clemson's going to deal with some pretty glaring mismatches on their front, uh, which puts all the more pressure on a lot of those receivers and skill guys to um, make very, very big plays on the perimeter and manufacture some ground yardage through the passing game. So that'll be a little subcontext to watching that game. But right now, Georgia, 
Kirby Smart and Todd Munkin, if you could go in those meeting rooms, considering what all we have spoken about with Georgia, and hopefully the ascendance of this offense to being a truly elite overall unit this year, I got to imagine they're looking around saying, well, can't do that if we don't have an offensive line we can trust. Now, I'm not suggesting to you we're throwing on the reverse lights and we're going backwards here on what I stated I expect from Georgia Sunday night. However, this is not ideal, obviously. Now, this is one where it didn't happen the week of the game, and so you're mixing and you're matching here. Cedric Van Praan is the guy for the record that is probably stepping in to fill the void here. But that is, again, to those of you who are unfamiliar with that name, that is a redshirt freshman who is going to make his first career start against the Clemson Tigers. Mismatch. Doesn't mean you can't win the game, but it just means it's definitely something that you're going to have to account for all night. And the, the nightmare vision that you get in your head if you're a Georgia fan is consistent pressure up the middle. Just consistent A-gap pressure the whole night. And at that point, when you're trying to develop a passing game that is predicated on things like timing and rhythm and you got pressure right up the middle in your face, it doesn't bode well. So this is something to keep an eye on. Those practice reports over at dogs247.com, very important practice reports. Because this is one of the most consequential games in the country, and it's happening in week one. I want to go to College Station right quick. I was doing a little digging today about the tight end situation at Texas A&M. So Baylor Cup is a name that a lot of us who follow the granular details of the SEC have been excited about for a couple of years. And then for a couple of years in a row, Baylor Cup tight end for Texas A&M has been lost due to injury. So we have not gotten to see him. And now, again, cross every finger you have. He's healthy right now. He's practicing and everyone's excited. But I was over on our Texas A&M 24-7 site today, and I saw Jeff Tarpley had put up an article, and it was it's interesting because it was kind of taking a little hunch or, or a little speckle of an idea I had already had, and it was advancing it like 15 or 20 more yards. But it's this simple question. Are you going to get what you think you're going to get in the context of maybe having both of these tight ends to put on the field this year? Uh, we I never pronounced Jalen Weidermeyer's name correctly. So I'm just going to say Jalen. But putting Jalen W. and Baylor Cup on the field at the same time, this is one of those Xbox crowd dream scenarios where, oh, man, if one's unstoppable, then imagine what both of them are. Well, what it is is it's another personnel package. And in reality, as Jeff pointed out in his article, it could actually be something that gives you an unintended consequence of limiting the overall potential of the other. You know, Weidermeyer is a guy who has a skill set that is emblematic of what people expected Baylor Cup to be. He's very versatile. I mean, you've seen him. He's been a nightmare. Uh, he is an All-American in every sense of the word tight end. And so the question becomes, when you've got a receiver room with the kind of depth that Texas A&M has now, and you got a backfield with the kind of depth they have, you know, what kind of personnel packages are we really throwing out there? Is it necessary anymore for those kinds of personnel packages to be out there where you got both of them on the field at the same time? It's good to have them. It certainly gives you more versatility and more options. I agree with Jeff, though. I don't necessarily know that the rotations are going to work out quite the way that I think you may draw it up on a depth chart or on a grease board or the back of a pizza box uh, in the preseason. Having said that, still very excited to see Baylor Cup. And lastly, certainly not the last time we're going to talk about this, though. Here we go. Knoxville, Tennessee. It has become my favorite position battle to track in the SEC right now. I was just over on the Vols 24-7 board within the last hour, and I saw that they had done a write-up on the segment that we did on Late Kick the other night about the Tennessee quarterbacks. Not only have I been riding the fence on this whole thing, I've been making almost a mockery of how much I'm riding the fence, almost like a surfer on top of the fence, because that's how proud I am of the balance I have on top of this thing right now. No one knows where this is going. I was looking at the odds right now, because yes, friends, you can bet such things. The odds to be the week one starter at quarterback for Tennessee. Right now, Joe Milton is the minus 175 money line favorite. Harrison Bailey next at plus 190. And then it's Hendon Hooker, the Virginia Tech transfer at plus 400, with Brian Maurer at plus 550. Director Collin, by the way, he, he knows the Tennessee quarterback uh, situation like the back of his hand. I mean, don't we have to look at Hooker here? Don't we have to take some Hooker action? You need to be careful. You need to watch your mouth. I'm looking at the live chat right now. You know good and well what I mean. 
Hendon Hooker, I'm going to read you now from Patrick Brown's highly confidential practice report just released within the last hour. Allow me to share intimate details. The early vibes in preseason camp are Joe Milton, Michigan transfer, and Hendon Hooker, Virginia Tech transfer, are out in front in the quarterback competition, but Thursday's scrimmage, which is in the future, looms very large. Additionally, today, Joe Milton, sharpest of the quarterbacks, this again, according to Patrick Brown, if you want the full report, go to Vols247.com. And they've really liked the leadership qualities of Hendon Hooker. My point is, I do not get the sense that there is overwhelming smart money in the room right now. I think that Patrick Brown's dead on the money, and I think what's going to happen is we're going to get into this scrimmage setting, and it's, I think it's really, really up in the air. And so here we go. All right, let me balance myself on top of the fence. Check out this sentence, Colin. I don't know how this is going to come out, but I know it's going to be non-definitive. How do I want to phrase this? I'm picturing this on a quote edit tomorrow. I want to really, really make it look indecisive. Hendon Hooker could very well win this job, but you certainly cannot count out Harrison Bailey. All the while, many people think it's Joe Milton's job to lose. That's skill. That's nothing but skill. So that's a quick look around the SEC. Sunday night, here's what very much excites me. And really Thursday, we will have had several scrimmages around the league. At that point, we're going to have probably as good a batch of intel as we'll have all camp because that's really where the weeding out start it's really where these coaching staffs want to start weeding out how many guys they're giving serious reps to in all seriousness now because what's happening right now in the first few days of install is they have measured the risk reward and they can afford to you know run four guys in this position group maybe even five guys in this position group you cannot continue to split reps like that and so this first scrimmage for guys that you think are going to be scout team, but we're going to give them a shot. Well, the first scrimmage really weeds those guys out. And then all of a sudden you see scout team jerseys, whereas you used to see regular jerseys, and then it's on. So sometimes you see that, sometimes you don't, depending on what the policy is at your respective university's practice. That's why some of the whispers and intel we'll have post-scrimmage one are going to be so important. We're not close to done with scrimmage intel and with camp intel. Now we just zoom it out, and we go all over the country. Here we go, Colin. Three, two, one. So how about some camp whispers and intel from all across the country, coast to coast? I want to start at Ohio State. This won't last long, but I opened up the inbox this morning when I was getting ready for the Late Kick Extra podcast, and I had some viewer questions about Ohio State's quarterback situation. And they were asking me, essentially, I'm hearing some really good things about Kyle McCord. Does this change your thinking about the pecking order in Columbus at the quarterback position? No, it doesn't at all you're going to hear some very good things about Kyle McCord. And I'm going to tell you why. Because Kyle McCord's a very good quarterback. He would start at most places in America. But this is not Kyle McCord's job. This is going to be C.J. Stroud's job. Of that, I am very, very confident. And I don't think you'll find many people of any rapport who follow Ohio State who are going to try and suggest otherwise to you. So they've got scrimmages coming up too. Okay, but let me take you back to the words out of the head coach's mouth there. These are Ryan Day's paraphrased words, not mine. He has told people since the start of camp they plan on or hope to be able to name a starter at quarterback after the first scrimmage or after the first couple of weeks of camp. In my experience, coaches never say that voluntarily unless they're already 95% sure themselves. Because think about what you're setting yourself up to do. What if it's indecisive? What if it's neck and neck and, and you've just gone ahead and put yourself out there again on your own volition and said, I'm going to name one after the first week, after the first two weeks, after the first scrimmage. He knows who it's going to be. I think he, number one, wants competition, which he's got. And number two, let's be real, he wants to keep as many of these quarterbacks on his roster as long as he can. So, no, I don't have any questions about the Ohio State quarterback situation. I will say this, though. How is it possible I have a hair in my eye right now? I have none naturally. Colin, where did that come from? Who's been – no one's been in here. All right, well, I want to get back on track now. So someone's hair other than mine was in my eye. I've seen the phrase quarterback controversy again. This is a dirty phrase. We don't believe in this on this show. But I've seen it floating around again. And I would like for someone to explain to me, this is rhetorical, because hair notwithstanding, there's no one else in this studio right now. But I would like for someone to explain to me what a quarterback controversy is. And why don't we have wide receiver controversies? Why do we never have safety controversies? We only have competition at those positions. But at quarterback, sometimes we have quarterback controversies. Now, if you're running a website out there and it is, it is 
imperative that you generate a minimum amount of clicks per day, okay, call it a controversy all you want to. But for the real ones in the room, what are we talking about when we say quarterback controversy? This is competition. There's nothing bad that's happening at Ohio State right now because they have multiple guys good enough to start. All right, let's move on. I do question how Florida State's going to handle their quarterback situation. If I was texting back and forth with a buddy down, lives very near Tallahassee, not exactly in Tallahassee, close to the program, though, he pays for that access, but he's very close to the program. And so we've been going back and forth all summer about Mackenzie Milton. I've spoken my piece on him here. I think ultimately he's going to give them the best chance to win football games. But at the same time, offensive tackle is going to be a weakness for this team this year. Let's just put it out there and state it like it is. Uh, this is not a team that has the kind of depth at that position to where even at their maximum potential, that's ever going to become a strength for them. Now, Everybody's got strengths and weaknesses, relatively speaking. Some are more glaring than others. But having stated that, it makes your quarterback vulnerable. Anytime you got weaknesses at tackle, it makes your quarterback vulnerable. And then you add into that the context that Mackenzie Milton is coming off a devastating injury. Now, much like Derek King down at Miami, we've heard all the right things about him. Even back in spring, we saw him move around. So it's not like anyone is chewing their fingernails down to the nubs, worrying about whether he can walk upright, but at the same time, having watched the history of this game, as you and I have, you know it makes you nervous. The first time you see a free rusher, not in a spring game where they're going to blow the whistle, and not in practice where it's not live bullets and it's a touch and it's a blow the play dead. This, in the fall, when Notre Dame is on the field with you 10 minutes into the first quarter, they're trying to knock your head off, figuratively. We don't want to win kicked out of a game. But they're trying to assault you at quarterback. They want to knock you out of the game. And so then it becomes real. And that's where the whole quarterback rotation possibly fits in here because the other situation to keep an eye on is Jordan Travis is having a really good camp for Florida State. And it's been a net positive positive for Jordan Travis no matter if he wins this job outright or not. Two positives there. Number one, this coaching staff has been a godsend for him, uh, both physically and mentally. And number two, I think Mackenzie Milton's been a godsend for him because not only do you have culturally just an infinitely better and less toxic environment for a quarterback to exist in, but you've got real premium competition there at the position. And a quarter, any, any player worth his salt, quarterback or otherwise, will tell you competition never made a mentally tough guy worse. It only made him better. And so... I think he is the latter instead of the former of that descriptor. And so I'm thinking to myself, if Jordan Travis does indeed progress throughout this camp and put on a good showing, even if he's not matching McKenzie Milton throw for throw, even if he's not grading out A for A with McKenzie Milton, given what the potential slight limitation may be on McKenzie Milton if he wins that job, I think it's ludicrous uh, to be surprised if both of these guys are worked into the rotation there at Florida State. I absolutely think both of them will play, uh, and play a lot this year. And that is injury or not, even if they're both healthy. Now I want to shift it, stay in the ACC for a second, but shift it to Clemson. Talked about this the other day, but since some Clemson fans think that I'm out with torch and pitchfork in hand to get them, we really got to lather them up in the preseason here. There are a couple of fan bases that I just have to handle differently, and Clemson's one of them because I cannot pronounce the name right, so that's already strike one. Strike two is a lot of Clemson folks think that the world's out to get them. I got a lot of Clemson buddies, and I'm talking directly to them right now. They know good and well who they are, and they know this in their heart to be true. So having said that, let me just tell you how much I love Clemson for a second, specifically the wide receiver position. It is no breaking news that they've got a lot of talent at receiver. It's the length it's the, it's the, it's the wingspan, like they, you can't fit the edges of the fingers on camera. Neither can I. I'm not starting at receiver for Clemson. I can assure you of that. So I put out a tweet today, and I was just marveling at the overall length in the receiver room. Good. Jesse's got it up. Jesse, by the way, is punching the show tonight from Connecticut. We've taken a break from Fort Lauderdale, giving those guys and girls the day off. We shifted our operation up to Connecticut, which has confused many of you because I am in Nashville, but we're just we're beaming this thing all over the place to get it to you live. Look at the length on this chart, though. If you're listening on the podcast, let me read these names to you. Justin Ross is 6'4", 205. E.J. Williams, 6'3", 190. Both of them hail from Phoenix City, Alabama, by the way. Shout out, Phoenix City. Uh, Frank Ladson is 6'3", 205. Ngata is 6'3", 220. Aju Aju, bless you, is 6'3", 220. There's not a guy in their receiver room that's going to see serious minutes this year that's under 6'3". Now, or compare that, rather 
with what Bama's been like the last couple of years, and they had the best receiver room by a mile in the country and sent four of them to the first round, and none of those guys were over 6'1", which just goes to show you there are several different ways still to skin the old wide receiver cat. But if you look at the B-roll, which is a fancy term for this really slow motion three-year-old footage we're showing right now, it's three years old for a reason. Well, the first highlight was. It was the length on display in the 2018 title game that we were discussing the other night where those 30-70 balls were getting caught and caught and caught, and all of a sudden, Bama's getting beat by four touchdowns by Clemson. How is that? Well, elite receiver play. That's how it was. And I'm having a really hard time not picking Clemson to win the national championship this year. This is not official, so this is just between you and I. Don't tell the folks that run our desk or CBSSports.com because I'm not ready to turn my picks in yet. But I'm... I'm leaning towards Clemson to win the national championship right now. Now, that would buy me, I think, a lot of credibility up there. Lastly, I want to go to Ann Arbor, and I want to talk about a guy that, as we sat here on National Signing Day, we were talking a whole lot about. Remember Donovan Edwards? It was Wilt Fong in here. Uh, I think Trey Scott was over in the nether regions of the edge of the studio. Uh, no, we had Trey on air that day, didn't we, Colin? And we had Director Colin, as always, on the ones and twos in there. But there was a guy we talked about a lot. After we got off the air, we said, did we do like seven Donovan Edwards segments? Well, we kind of did because we thought he was going to be a big deal. And then subsequently on Late Kick, I talked about him a lot. This is a four-star, high four-star, true freshman running back. You see his bio if you're watching here on YouTube. He chose Michigan over Notre Dame, among other programs. This was a really, really big get. At the time, they'd gotten Xavier Worthy. Now, since then, he's gone on to Texas. But they got Donovan Edwards to go to Michigan. And so... The reason I made such a big deal about him is because we had people behind the scenes telling us there is zero chance, unless he, unless he stubs a toe or he's got an ingrown toenail or a lot of toe issues, apparently, unless he hurts himself, he's going to be playing very early for them because he's one of the most college-ready backs you'll ever see. From the neck up, he's totally there. Physically, he's totally there. He's, he's 5'11", 190, put together really, really well, and he's a complete back. There aren't glaring weaknesses to his game. And he's going to Michigan, where they need guys like that. Well, sure enough, early on in camp at Michigan, that's all anyone wants to talk about. They want to talk about Donovan Edwards, and there are two things that stand out about him, really, if you talk to people close to the program up there. One is skill set, but number two is total self-starter. He's the kind of guy, sometimes I make this comparison, in the atmospheric science world, we have closed, cold core lows sometimes, and they're very unique. One of the only chances you're going to get snow in the south is if one of those rogue systems comes through. But what's so fascinating about it from a meteorological perspective is they provide their own cold air. It can be 70 degrees all around them. But that little system can be pumping 32-degree air in itself, and it can make its own cold air. It doesn't come from Canada or anywhere else. Well, that's kind of how folks like Donovan Edwards are. When they walk in a room, you could be in an office building and know someone like this. You can be in a football complex and know someone like this. They don't need motivation externally. They don't need you to pump them up. They don't need you to disrespect them before they get angry. Uh, They don't need to see anybody else. They don't need to be led. They are leaders. It's intrinsic. It's in them. And when those kinds of guys walk in the door, I don't care if they're 18 years old or 22 years old, true freshman or senior, they impact the rest of your program. Donovan Edwards, from the day he's been on campus at Ann Arbor, has started to impact the Michigan program. Now, in an ideal world, you got several guys like that, but you take as many of them as you can get, and Donovan Edwards is a really good one. So you're going to watch Michigan play early in the season. They got that big game against Washington in Week 2, which is the first time most of you will watch them. Watch for Donovan Edwards, true freshman running back. All right, let's take a, let's take a, little, a little swerve, and let's go out west all the way to the desert, all the way to Las Vegas. So a little story for you. It's been a very eventful couple of days for... Director Colin, myself, several other people here, most of which I can't talk to you about yet. But if you were following me on Instagram, you probably saw a lot of it. So it culminated last night. We went out to eat with a couple of the high-level mustaches here at CBS. It's well after closing time, so they're not watching the show. And one of the high-level mustaches, which ironic because he himself does not have a mustache, but if you're management, you are a high-level mustache. He said to me in a crowded restaurant in downtown Nashville, I think you should talk more gambling on Lake Kick. And I said, mustache, mustache, mustache. Have you not heard of the Ramen Noodle Express? And he said, no, tell me about this Ramen Noodle Express. Where does it run to? What what rail corridor is it in? Well, it's not an actual train, sir. Well, explain it to me. Make it make sense. Well, it's our gambling segment on Lake Kick. 
What does that have to do with ramen noodles or a train? I can't spell it out for you. All I'm telling you is it means something to our audience. They know what it means. It's kind of inside. And if you don't watch the show, you don't get it. You don't get it. That's fine. But you guys are up there. In the corporate world, you got $50 ice cream scoops. We're down here in the trenches. We're, we're down in the wells and the mines. And we are trying very much to stay off the ramen noodle diet. And the only way we can do that in many cases is by hitting Western Michigan plus three and a half late in the game this fall in week three. And that is where the Ramen Noodle Express was born. And every fall in the season, weeks one, weeks two, weeks seven, week eight, you know to come here and you know we're giving you enough winners to keep you off that diet. Unless you start parlaying, at which point you deserve every bit of terrible luck that comes your way. Because it's not luck at all. Parlays are Satan's tool. And I can't put it any plainer than that. So don't do meth, don't bet parlays, two of the only rules we have on the show. But I want to take a look at some games of the year. These, I want to be careful here, these are not games that we're telling you to bet on yet. Now, if you choose to, that's fine. I have moved on a couple of these, and I will tell you the bets I've made. But I want to tell you, the way we hand out any pick on this show during the fall is we run it through a model. And it's proprietary. I work with someone, and we, we've built this thing for a long time. When I say we, uh, he mainly builds. I mainly give vision and some guidance and assistance. But we're really proud of it, and we really trust it. We don't brag about it a lot, because if we bragged about the percentages it hits out, it would sound like we're full of it and we're lying. So we just win. So we did last year on the show. The picks we handed out here hit at uh, 53 and 37. I think it was like a 60.1% winning percentage against the spread. Incredibly good. And so having said that, I decided, all right, high-level mustache, I'm going to meet you halfway. We're going to talk some gambling on Late Kick tonight. I am going to run the model on five games of the year. I'm going to tell you what the Vegas number is right now. You can bet four out of these five games. And then I'm going to tell you what our model says. Let's start, and we're just going random here. Georgia versus Florida. This is the game. I can't remember. It's, it's a little bit later in the season. But the Vegas number right now is Georgia minus 7.5. You can bet this number widely at minus 7.5. Keep in mind, what I'm going to show you is raw model output. So there would be a couple of other factors added in. If this was the week of this game, we would take the raw model data, and then we would add a couple of little caveats of our own, and it would pump out our official number. But our raw model data, if we have that, we'll roll it now, is Georgia minus 9. So we still lean a little heavier on the dogs than do the guys in the desert who have set this number. This is a game that has a chance to move on opening weekend. Keep in mind, this is a futures number, so it moves with the market throughout the season. Believe it or not, this is probably the next most losable game that Georgia has all year. They've got the Clemson game in week one, and this is probably the next most losable game they have all year. Now, that doesn't really mean anything within the context of this, but what I'm saying is something that would seriously affect this line is probably going to have to be happening to Florida. Probably not happening on the Georgia side. So if Georgia were to get pasted like 44-27 in the first week, you may see some movement on this. But right now, this is where it stands. We think the opposite. Okay, What, what our model in a forward-thinking fashion, because we built a model that thinks, is doing is we think Georgia's offense is probably going to overachieve relative to whatever the market expectation is right now and probably about one and a half points per season overachieve relative to expectations. So that explains the gap between Vegas and our number. Moving on. I think, Jesse, the one game that we did not have a Vegas number on, but I have a very strong opinion on, is Utah at USC. This is going to, I think, determine the Pac-12 South. That's my opinion. But we're not handing out season predictions here yet. But what I do want to tell you is this is October 9th. It's the only big game on Southern Cal's schedule where the Trojans don't have a decided scheduling dynamic advantage. They have got a very workable schedule. It's like Clay Helton drew it up himself except for this game. And this is the wrong game to be on the wrong end of the scheduling dynamic because I think this is... Um, their toughest game. This is a veteran Utah team, one we're going to talk about more in just a second. This is our number. We've got Southern Cal minus one. Let me translate that for you because that adds in home field. We think Utah is better than USC. My power ratings, when they come out a little bit later this month, unless something crazy happens, we will have Utah rated higher than USC. So keep that in mind. There is... There is a word going around the water cooler out in Salt Lake City that's not all that hard to believe that this is such a veteran-laden team for Utah and there is so little brand new install happening out there right now 
that this is a team that is ripe to be able to circle a game, especially one that you're going to have a bye week before anyway, and have your own totally unique game plan installed for that particular contest. And I think that's exactly what Utah is doing. Partly right now, partly in the summer, and then they can fine-tune that thing when they get to the bye week and got 13 days prep when they get in the season. Utah is going to be ready for Southern Cal. How about Penn State at Iowa? This one is happening on what I think is the biggest Saturday of the year. And it is a game that has such variance because both teams have games, several of which that they could lose that could impact the uh, market's opinion here. To give you an idea of what happens before this matchup, Penn State plays at Wisconsin, they play Auburn, and they play Indiana. Iowa, by this time, will have already played Indiana at Iowa State and at Maryland. All six of those games are losable. Some of them they'll be dogs in. Having said that, the current Vegas number on this game is Iowa minus three. And our model just disagrees. And I would agree with our model here. There is not much tweaking I would do on this line. We have got this at pick. I have already bet Penn State in this spot. So this is one I've moved on. It's not an official handout, but it's one I've already moved on. I really like Penn State in this spot. You're going to need to watch Penn State in week one. It's a losable game. It's a game they won't be favored in. They're at Wisconsin. So if you don't want to move here, and I already played it because I just like the number, but there is some strategy in waiting until after week one because Penn State could lose to Wisconsin in week one and not change my opinion on this game one bit. I mean, if they lose 34-27, I still see this game the same way, but the market may not, especially if Iowa were to beat Indiana in week one. You may see this move off and go to three and a half or four, and then you could get some added value. I'm happy with the value now. I just want to tell you that's how we would explain that and why maybe if you wanted to wait, you should wait. Iowa State at Oklahoma. For personal reasons, I'm not going to have much comment on this game, but I did feel that I owed it to you to show you the number and to show you there is no bias involved in the late kick model. Iowa State at Oklahoma, we have as Sooners, well, I'm going to tell you what Vegas has first. Vegas has Oklahoma minus 9.5. We got Oklahoma minus 11. Now, again, if I had a green screen behind me, I would just put a green circle on my chest right now so you could see through it to represent how much this rips my heart out. Because what I want to be able to tell you is I want to tell you, oh, we think this is way too fat. There's a lot of public square money on Oklahoma. No, 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 friends. This should be under a touchdown. But that's just not the way the model sees it right now. Like I said, I'm not going to give you much comment because I wish the model didn't see it this way. But this one is, it's later in the season. Time to change. We'll see. Maybe Matt Campbell installs some new gadgets in his offense. Because believe me, they got plenty of time and plenty of returning starters too. The last one I wanted to hit right quick is Bama at Texas A&M. This is happening the same day as Penn State, Iowa. Bama minus 10 and a half at Texas A&M. That's what our model sees. And it's very much in line, a little bit shorter, but pretty much in line with what the guys in the desert see. Now, with Alabama, I think I talked about this like a month ago, we see every Alabama game right this second as about a point to a point and a half short of what the Vegas number is. That's the Dallas Cowboy effect. That's very, very, um, that's very, very public nature of team being baked into line sort of deal. So we agree with the odds makers. It's just the odds makers have baked in a little a little added juice there without calling it juice on Alabama. But this is a fascinating game because it may decide the SEC West. But I also want you to think about this. If you go look at Texas A&M's schedule, you could make the argument that this is the first game, potentially, that they'll have to ask Haynes King to win. Now, that carries with it its own set of obstacles. Alabama's always a big obstacle. But then the third context that you need here to make this very, very in focus is Alabama's defense is as poised to play takeaway this year and harass your quarterback and spike on those havoc rate indexes or indices as they have been in several years. So you've got a formula for disaster there, potentially, wherein you're asking your quarterback to do more through the air than he will at any point all year, and you're facing the most opportunistic and lethal defense that you will face at any point all year. So Alabama minus 10 and a half, you're gonna, or 11 and a half, you're going to look at that, you're going to say, whoo, that's a fat number. How does it get out of hand? Well, that's how it would get out of hand. Turnovers is how it would get out of hand. Okay, let's move on. Colin, by the way, so, since we're here rested in the middle of a segment, I think our air conditioner's on the fritz again. It's talking to me in Morse code up here. 
So if we can't hear it, it's not a big deal. If we can hear it, I don't want to be made fun of in the comment section when we put the individual video out. All right, let's roll on. I was told the other day we don't talk enough Pac-12. I totally disagree. I think we've talked a lot of Pac-12 on the show, but I listened to the audience, and more than a few of you said it. So we're going to finish the show tonight by giving you the biggest questions in the Pac-12. Here we go, Colin. Three, two, one. Let's talk Pac-12 football. Biggest questions out on the West Coast. We waste no time. The first thing I want to know is what is Oregon's offense in 2021? I'm not talking about the personnel or who's going to win this position battle, but overall, this team has a lot to be excited about. If you don't pay attention, if you live in Raleigh, North Carolina, and you don't really pay attention to Pac-12 football, this to me is one of the best chances of having one of those non-traditional powers crash the playoff party. But the thing about it is we got to get some of these questions answered. Because if Oregon is just going to be a pretty good offense, one that's good enough to contend for and maybe even win the Pac-12, but then that's about it. Well, that's nothing to write home about because there's a, a growing gap between the phrase Pac-12 contender versus college football playoff contender. Well, the thing about it is they're as loaded as I remember them being at any point, to be honest with you, at wide receiver. You could say the same at running back, at least over the last several years. And Anthony Brown is a multi, multi, multi-year experienced quarterback, and they've got good quarterback depth. So this sounds like a formula for a very explosive offense. That's what people are waiting on, Duck fans included. They're waiting to turn on an Oregon game and see the sum total equal to or even greater than the individual parts. If that happens, then Oregon's going to win the Pac-12. And if that happens, then this is going to be a team that could be a fringe noisemaker in the playoff discussion. But what we don't want is we don't want to look at all this firepower on an Oregon preseason depth chart and then get out on the interstate and go 65 miles an hour. 65 is good enough. It'll eventually get you where you're going. But when we have a sports car, there's no excuse to be doing 65. Right lane or not, there's no excuse to only be 65 on the interstate out there. So we need to put it on the floor. We need to see if we can hit 90, 95. That would be a quantum leap forward for Oregon football. Let's go to USC. USC is listed, I think as of this moment, they are a co-favorite to win the Pac-12 South or the USC Trojans. So my question with USC is, how am I supposed to feel about them? There's a movie, The Words, and uh, Bradley Cooper, Zoe Saldana, they're out in an alley, and Bradley Cooper just drops the, I'm not the man I thought I was, on her. And she looks at him and says, how is that supposed to make me feel? Well, I'm looking at USC, and I don't really know how to feel. I got a full Bradley Cooper complex about myself right now. I don't know how to feel about USC because on one hand, I'm looking at odds makers tell me something. I'm looking at preview magazine culture tell me something. I'm looking at Heisman odds in a fringe manner tell me things. And then when you get closer on the ground in Southern California, if you listen to the fan base, they will tell you a different story. Southern Cal fans do not have a ton of confidence in the overall direction of the program right now. They are rooting for the program. It's not some toxic situation, you know, where they are rooting for their own demise, but they're looking and they're saying, well, recruiting seems to have stalled a bit again by Southern Cal standards, uh, specifically at certain positions. I'll leave it at that. And then also the toughness of this team, when we watch the other big boys nationally, our talent roster may be comparable in some cases, but the overall level of play is not, do we feel like we're trending on an upward trajectory? They don't all feel like that. And so I arrived back at my question of how am I supposed to feel about USC? Am I supposed to believe the more national hype or am I supposed to listen to the more legitimate on the ground concerns? Because right now, as I said, they're a co-favorite to win the Pac-12 South, which brings me to Utah because USC is a co-favorite to win the Pac-12 South. You know who they're a co-favorite with? It ain't Utah. As of today, even given all the off-field questions, it was still Arizona State. They are plus 200, each of them, to win the Pac-12 South. Now, for the record, Utah is right behind them at plus 250. But Utah, my simple question about them is why not Utah? Look at everything you have going for you. If you want to back Utah, which I very much am right now as the leader in the Pac-12 South clubhouse, I've got the Kyle Whittingham reputation, been there forever at this point, very dependable style of play on Kyle Whittingham teams, but they've got two very good quarterback options. Cam Rising is the guy who was already there. Of course, they've brought Charlie Brewer in. I don't know how many more times I can hear a stat line from a spring game. 
it is impressive if you go 15 for 15 against air in a pool with a Nerf ball. Having said that, two good options, much better than none, two good options there. But also, this is the deepest team Kyle Whittingham has had since he's been at Utah. He's been there a long time. Guys, they've had some really good teams. According to him and people around the program, this is the deepest they've been. And so what does that do? Well, obviously, it gives them a leg up in several facets, but here's what's key. Defensively, they were a step off last year, but they got, I think, four or five games in. That's going to be imperative. You're going to watch Utah this year, and I think you'll watch them defensively, and you'll say, and that coaching staff will end up telling you, boy, I'm glad we got those five games in last year. It may not have been anything to write home about necessarily, but the incremental steps that we needed this team to take, we ended up taking this year because of some of the lumps that we took last year. They got a bunch of guys back, really good pieces. I'm very excited about Utah. As of the moment, that's the team I would pick to win the Pac-12 South. Lastly, I want to go all the way up the Pacific Coast, all the way to Washington, and I want to talk about the Huskies. And I just want to ask, does Washington have enough juice offensively to do what they want to do? We've heard they may be favored in every game, certainly favored in 11 of 12, well, 10 of 12, certainly, and then maybe 11 of 12. But there have been some mixed results in camp up there so far. Uh, there's a lot of promise, but, you know, you look at their offensive line and they're massive. I mean, that certainly is a unit that you can go to battle with. You can rely on it to lean on teams. This will be an excellent team this year at playing with the lead. Is it realistic to expect to play with the lead the whole year? No, it's not really. And so then you start thinking about being able to trade points or being able to close a gap or come from behind on teams. Well, what you need is really good receiver play to do that. And that's the unit with Washington that has had some early inconsistency in camp. Long way to go in camp, but they've had some early inconsistency there. The other really fun thing to watch is I was over on the Washington board earlier today, and there were some people that were talking about uh, young Heward has come in, and he is not immediately thrust into the spotlight. He's not running with the ones quite yet. And so Sam Heward came in with a lot of acclaim and a lot of fanfare, and he's been there like 15 minutes. And no, he's not running with the ones. He's probably more their third option at the moment. That's not a bad thing. <laughs> It's not a bad thing at all when a high-profile guy comes in and cannot crack the starting rotation. It doesn't always mean he's overrated. What it could mean is got a couple of good options ahead of him. And Dylan Morris is a plenty good enough option for them. Uh, Patrick O'Brien saw and read some good things about him today. So Washington, there is reason to be excited there. Certainly there is. You look at the schedule, there's another reason to be excited. But the thing about it is they need, to, they need a level of play that is not determined just on let's be three points better than the opposition every week. Because that's not how you make a great team, man. you got to operate to a standard up there. And if you're ever going to do what ultimately you want to do, which is win the Pac-12 North and go play for a conference title, you're going to have to have units like the receiver position take several steps forward. And you're going to have to have, obviously, a lot of other elements fall into place. But Washington, just overall, that's the biggest doubt, I think, nationally that people would have. They'll look at Jimmy Lake and they'll say, I don't doubt a second's worth of that guy's defensive prowess, but a guy in Jimmy Lake with a defensive background leading the program, I'll sit here and have the same questions about him I had about Jeremy Pruitt at Tennessee. A lot of people think that way. I don't blame them. I mean, Kirby Smart's a defensive guy. What are we questioning about Georgia still? So it's not the craziest concept in the world to see a defensive guy's offense lag a little bit to start their career, but Washington is in prime position right now to do some interesting things. Uh, I'm in prime position to get out of here because, number one, the AC is still on the fritz. And number two, I got another podcast to do at 9 o'clock. So we really appreciate you guys watching. Quick favor, 68% of our audience is still unsubscribed. I don't know. You're asking? I don't know. All I'm suggesting to you is if you would like to keep the show free forever, then subscribe to the YouTube channel. doesn't cost you a dime. And also follow me on Twitter, Instagram, at LateKickJosh. Just these simple gestures of good faith go a long way in keeping the show free dollars and free cents to you. So thank you so much. For our crew in Connecticut tonight, we just, we're just we jet-setting. We're globe-trotting with production. So thank you to them. Good to have Jesse back in the saddle for a Tuesday night here. And Director Colin, as always, steady at the wheel in our Nashville control room. I am merely Josh Pate. They just pay me to sit out here and talk for 45 minutes. And uh, I have more than effectively done that, I think. So thank you so much for watching. We'll see you back here Thursday night. Until then, have a great rest of your evening, and God bless.